Everybody, please be seated. And remember, we're still in closed session. I would like to invite Jake Van Dam to say a word of prayer. Good afternoon, everybody. Before I begin praying, or before I ask you to join me in prayer, just a little background info. So I'm Jake Van Dam, a uh, delegate from Classes Yellowstone, and uh, back home right now, they're going through some pretty severe flooding. We had lots of snow and rain this spring, which was good for the crops um, down the valley, but in the mountains, uh, water levels have been rising and rising. Uh, if you, when you have time, do a quick search of Yellowstone River and Montana, you'll no doubt see uh, houses floating away, cabins floating away, road um, getting undercut and swept away by the river. Uh, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, Yellowstone Park is being evacuated right now. Um, I think they plan on opening at some point again, but uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big disaster. I'm not super old, but I have been paying attention to Montana for the past 37 or so years, and we've never had anything quite this big happen. So um, if you wouldn't mind joining me in prayer, I'd sure appreciate it. Uh, let's pray. Father God, we come before you this afternoon, uh, grateful that we can just gather his body, Lord, make decisions, uh, Lord, um, hopefully work towards unity um, and come together, but Lord, right now I just ask that we'd be able to come together uh, on behalf of your people, people that uh, don't necessarily have someone represented here, Lord, there's no churches there that are part of the CRC, and yet, Lord, there are people who are your children. Lord, these are people who have lost their property. Lord, there are people there who have lost their businesses, um, their means of making a living. Um, Lord, I've not heard of any deaths, Lord, and I pray that that would continue to be the case. But Lord, if there are, we just pray that you be with any families there who are mourning that loss. Um, Lord, and right now I'd also like to pray for those who are working to help evacuate both the park and the area. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would also be with those who will be affected um, in the wake of this event. Lord, not only for those living in the area, um, but Lord, if the park closes down, people don't get to visit, businesses that rely on tourism um, will no doubt be effective majorly and maybe even have to close down themselves. Um, Lord, we just uh, pray that those like uh, Manhattan Christian Reformed Church, Bethel Church, Bozeman Church, as well as other churches in the area would be uh, spurred to reach out and to offer help in uh, whatever form that may be. Lord, uh, thank you that we can lay these requests before you, knowing that you've already got a plan and uh, are working towards uh, a good end to the situation. Let's pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I know that uh, Luann doesn't have any gifts at this point, but we do have a pair of glasses that maybe we can auction off. <laughs> so if they belong to you, they are right here. Just a couple of... Um, oh. How much shall, we, shall they go for? <laughs> <laughs> you can honor that one by coming to my house like we talked about um, all right just a couple of um uh of, uh, of notes before we, we begin we are going to need since we tabled it there was a motion to table we're going to need a motion to untable hold on i also want to remind you economy of words when you speak speak to the motion do not get into a long discussion of backgrounds or anything. Um, so we, we want to make the, our time um, um, worthy of, uh, of, 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 the, of the topic that we're, we're talking right now. So please, again, I'm going to ask you to uh, speak to the motion. We are going to keep the two-minute rule, given that we have a lot of um, things to discuss. But I will make a couple of exceptions for uh, some of the folks from, um, from Neelan that have asked to speak. So um, we're going to, with that, do I hear a motion to untable? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So we return to the uh, recommendations that we have at hand. 
So the recommendation number one that was um, uh, put on the floor that Senate instruct Neelan Avenue CRC to immediately rescind its decision to ordain a deacon in a same-sex marriage, thus nullifying this deacon's current term. That was moved and supported. The motion has been made. Okay. Dis um, discussion. Okay, Rebecca, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Rebecca Jordan Heiss, Class of Grand Rapids East. I speak against the motion, and I have one um, piece of information and then uh, one reason to tell you about um, that I, I speak against this motion. The background is that Neeland Avenue Church is known, um, not just in our classes, but in the neighborhood and in the community, it is known not as an activist church. It's known as a church that is deeply engaged in its urban neighborhood. And it's known as, as a church that includes people that disagree with each other. Um, this is not a church that is all decided, but it's a community that's um, wrestling together like many other congregations. That's the background. And the reason I speak against this is that I believe it's not wise for Synod um, to speak into the matters of this congregation in this way. Neeland ordained a member in good standing as a deacon, and for this member to be under discipline would be a matter between the elders of Neeland Avenue Church and that member. The grounds remind us that Synod can intervene in a lower assembly if the well-being of the churches in common is at stake. I would argue that it is not, but that this is about the well-being of Neeland Avenue Church and its mission in their neighborhood. Our vote today is not a vote of the meeting of the elders at Neeland Avenue Church, but this is a vote of the Synod, and I urge you to vote no. Anthony Ellenbos and Lynette Vanderhoffmeyer, Larry Lauders. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anthony Ellenbos, Class is Hamilton. Uh, the precedents that we've made reference to of where a synod has intervened in the matters of, um, of a classis or a council are times when there's been appeal that has been made. So this would be a new action and a new precedent, I think, and for, therefore I vote against this motion, if I didn't say that. Um, also, I recognize that um, the authority in the church is, uh, in the local council is original. And I think there is something that we need to honor there about the, uh, the context. In uh, many urban contexts, there's quite different realities than in a lot of rural contexts. And I grew up in a rural context. I fully understand that I'm living in a very different world now in the city of Hamilton than I was uh, when I grew up. But I recognize that Neeland has wrestled well uh, over 10 years and in conversation with their classes as they discerned together, as they did a pile of theological and biblical work together. Um, and I think uh, in this case, they have made it an accommodation for one particular sin uh, one particular uh, situation of a same-sex uh, monogamous marriage uh, when they knew a person who has served well as a deacon previously. I don't think they've made a, a general rule. I don't think they're on a slippery slope. I think they've made a very well-reasoned and precise action. I think that is to be honored. I also recognize that John Calvin uh, has warned us that when we pick up church discipline, if we're disciplining something that has gone mainstream in the culture, sometimes it is wise to leave it alone, and I think that's certainly true in urban cultures, because in this case, does discipline really achieve what we are setting out for it to achieve, the ends for which we've been entrusted with church discipline? And I'm not sure that it will in this case, and I think God's way with us is also a way of influence, uh, not coercion. Thank you. Yes. Lynette Vandy Hoof Myers from Classes Ontario Southwest. Um, I understand the procedural aspect of this and I understand the church order piece of it. Um, I lament the lack of pastoral, a pastoral nature to our dealing with Neeland up to this point. 
and currently in the, the coldness of this statement. Um, church discipline is a process of discipleship where we walk alongside people in relationship. And I, aside from being a sister in Christ with Neeland, don't have a relationship with anyone in that church. And so I understand the process of this body. But I really, it makes my stomach turn the way that we're handling it. Just a comment regarding that is that a lot of times we make decisions here that may seem to be cold, but the real work really starts in a couple of days. We end up rushed to do the work that we have at hand. Yeah, we have delegates that have to go home for different reasons, uh, otherwise we'd be here longer. But the, the real work, Lynette, um, starts after, after, after we go home, and that's where the, um, all of these things have to be really tended to in a more personal manner. And I lament with you too. I'm, I'm sorry that a lot of these things just can't be dealt with, and it does, it does hurt me. It does bear heavy on my heart that we can't do that. But we've, called, we've been called to a task, and as cold as it may seem, we still have to meet those, we still have to meet that task. But yes, there is more lamenting than, than you may um, know that's happening right now. I believe the next speaker is Larry Louders, is that not correct? Yes. Before we do this, can I raise a point of order, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I believe that, if I understand correctly, Larry, you're the, Mr. Chairman, Larry Louders is the president of Neelands Council. Is yes. that correct? Uh-huh. Um, I'm going to recognize the sensitivity of this right up front, and I hope you take this for what it is. Um, but I think the body would benefit from knowing the parameters under which um, members of Neeland Avenue Church participate in this conversation. One of the things that church order is clear about is that members of a council do not get to vote on this motion because they're particularly involved. Yes, that's correct. As, according to Article 34, the delegate can, may not vote on matters in which the delegate of the church of which he is a member is particularly involved. I'm gonna turn that over to Kathy so she can explain a little more about that. That way if there's any clarity that has to be brought to this, we have it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it might be helpful to read the entire Article 34 of the church order. The major assemblies are composed of office bearers who are delegated by their constituent minor assemblies. The minor assemblies shall provide their delegates with proper credentials, which authorize them to deliberate and vote on matters brought before the major assemblies. A delegate shall not vote on any matter in which the delegate or the church of which the delegate is a member is particularly involved. You notice that last sentence puts a constraint on delegates um, who are involved in a particular matter, and the constraint is that they cannot vote. That sentence does not say they cannot deliberate. So, um, as I was asked at the break, um, the delegates from this church, this classes, um, may be part of the discussion, but may not vote. I would compare this to situations in a, in a classes. There are about a congregation, a church, or a pastor, and decisions have to be made, and oftentimes it's actually helpful or useful, or perhaps not, but the delegates from that church are often involved in the discussion of those matters, but of course they don't vote on their, 
the matters that have, the decisions that have to be made regarding themselves or their church. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. May I express my concern for just a moment? Just, just to say what, I'm, what, what I wanted to say. Um, I, I think in a situation like this that I think this conversation can go well. So I just want to say that. I'm not trying to say that our brothers and sisters from Neelan should not, should not be able to speak to this. But I think one of the challenges in this kind of a situation is that this can quickly go from processing a recommendation of the advisory committee into preemptively hearing an appeal. And I just think that we would do well as a body to keep that distinction in mind. And I say that with all the respect, and I, I trust that our uh, brother here will be able to keep that in mind too. So I hope you hear that not as an addictive comment, but as one that helps us as a body deliberate better. And I respect your judgment, whatever you decide, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me proceed. Uh, Larry Lauders, Grand Rapids East, and under these circumstances, Joel is right. I was the admin elder at Neeland. And uh, so I was the one you sent all those letters to. Um, I'm happy to report that I'm glad to be here and interact with some of the folks that sent these letters, and I found a very gracious spirit that I did not always find in those letters uh, of concern. I want to reiterate what Rebecca said. This is a church found in the inner city. We do much more than just this one issue. Um, we are not of one mind with this. Um, so I really want you to understand that piece of it. Regarding the process, this is now a top-down. I think that's a dangerous precedent to set. Maybe it's not a precedent, and maybe you're well within your rights to do this. But in our mind, it's a change of the rules a bit. Because as we entered this, we consulted it. We were understood this to be pastoral guidance. And guidance or is guidance. Or, and, and so we were able to sort of disagree with that. We did not view it as covenant breaking, and we really grieve that the, this body has ruled it as covenant breaking. I really, the, the heaviest piece of this, I think, is in this 10 year process, we prayed. We follow the Spirit. We have a unique ministry. And as some of you have said, well, there are different spirits speaking, which to me is code that you are thinking, and I think some of you do, that we're follow following a false spirit. That's hard to take. We love the CRC. You're going to have to kick us out. We, 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 Thank you for allowing more time. Yes. Um, now, this top-down, I think the old method of sort of dealing with these issues was at the local congregation. So if there's an issue of discipline, a congregant can come to the council and then go to the classes and up. This is top-down. That's a different direction. The COD in their letter actually recognized that process when they admonished us they said explicitly in that letter, we recognize that this is not up to church order, that we're not to do this. So this feels like a bit of a switch or pulling the rug out from underneath us. So I would really humbly suggest maybe there's another process we can do, and that's the original one. Come to my congregation. I'll give you a list of names. We're not of one agreement. You can talk to one of them, and now that we are clearly out of bounds... They can appeal to our consul, and if our consul doesn't deal with it, they can bring it up to classes. If classes doesn't deal with it, then it can come to Senate. Thank you very much for your comments, but, Larry. May I finish with one, one last comment? Okay. I'll grant it. Okay. Now, maybe I, that may not work, because I think we have chosen to live in tension on this, and we think that sharpens our ministry. Class of Grand Rapids East has chosen to live in tension, even though we're not of one like mine. We were hoping that that would model what, what Synod would do, and clearly that's not the action. So we're going to, I think, we're not going to be sharpened by diversity as much as we can. And I've had great conversations with people that I disagree with, and we will be missing that if, as we try to sort of clean house.
Thank you. We have um, John Vanderstoop, Michael Randall, Karen Walker, and Barbara Baltice. Thank you, Mr. President. John Vanderstoop, classes you're on. We are a family of faith, and families have culture. The culture of our family is centered on Christ, and I celebrate this. This week, as we've laughed and cried together and prayed and worshiped and deliberated and fellowshiped and shared the bread and the cup, we have so much to celebrate about what God is doing in the church. But our denominational family culture is also poisoned by political alliances, by the inordinate voices of wealth and power, by racism, and by homophobia. When a member of the family notices this and is convicted that the culture of the broader family is not living into the full richness of the body of Christ drawn from all humanity, that individual member of the family must take action. This member of our family, Neeland Avenue Christian Reformed Church, has taken an action born of their convictions shaped by a biblical reformed faith centered on Jesus. That action challenges the culture and before us now, the stated rules of the family. I support their local action. I'm convicted that Christ would do the same. History will tell us whether their action was prophetic and as prophetic action, a gift to us. Meanwhile, their action as a congregation forces us as synod to respond. Our rules compel us not to do nothing. I understand that. But I urge my brother, our brother from Neeland Avenue Christian Reformed Church and by extension the delegates from classes Grand Rapids East to consider to stand by your prophetic action, not as a protest, but because it is your obedience to the prophetic call driven, given you by Christ. And when you do, I pray that the rest of the family might not only hear it, but be shaped by it in ways that help us more faithfully reflect the radically obedient and radically hospitable body of Christ. I cede my two seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Miguel Randall from Central Plains. Um, I am gonna speak against this motion and I hope you don't rule me out of order. This will apply for all of the motions here. It seems to me that we could be having this conversation at pretty much any point in history of our church. If we were to go back to the mid 50s, we could be sitting here talking about punishing a church that integrated before the church body was ready. A few years after that, we could be having a conversation about a church that installed a deacon or an elder who was in a mixed race marriage. Because before that, it was against the church policy. 25 years ago, or before 25 years ago, we could be admonishing a church for installing a, a woman as a deacon or an elder as a pastor. I, I wonder what side we'd want to be on. Looking back through history now, would we want to register our yay vote to punish a church that integrated? Or that allowed mixed marriage? Or allowed women? I surely hope that we would not want to be on that side. I'm reminded of Acts 5, after the angel of the Lord let Peter and the apostles out of jail. And forgive me, reading names sometimes is not my strong suit. But Gamaliel advised the men of Israel to just wait, to see if what Peter and the apostles were doing were of God. He said, if they are of man, they will surely fail. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow it. Sure, the men of Israel could have easily killed Peter and the apostle, but what their meaning is, more would have come after. And in the end, they would not have been able to overthrow I suggest we take Game Mill's lead here and we wait. Let's see if Neeland is bearing good fruit because I, for one, do not want to be on the wrong side of God. Thank you. Karen Walker, Barbara Boltheis, and Jason Reese. Thank you, Mr. President. Karen Walker from Classes Hackensack. Um, as I heard my brother talk, I realized that I was one of the people he was talking about when the church had a stance against interracial marriage. I'm a widow now, but I was married for 49 years to an African-American man who I met in a Christian Reformed church. 
My fear is that this is so much broader than homosexuality. Because once we start going down that slope, we are isolating homosexuality out of all the other sins that are listed. But I don't necessarily know who in this room might have committed adultery, or who in this room might engage in pornography. Those sins are listed in that same paragraph. And so I just challenge us all to please, please, don't cast the first stone only if you are without sin. Can you do that? Yes, Barbara. Barb Bultice, Classes Rocky Mountain. Not because I want to end the conversation here, but because I think 24 voices is going to be enough, I'd like to call the question. Okay, the question's been called. Support. All right. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, Jason Reese. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would correct, just my, my last name is pronounced Rice. I know it sounds, I appreciate being adopted into Casejo Latino, um, but it is Rice and I, yeah. And I'm from Classis, Wisconsin. And I just wanna begin by saying that this is hard, right? Um, discipline is hard and weighty and difficult and anytime we enter into it our pulses start to race and our souls feel really really heavy and I don't know anyone who enjoys taking disciplinary action which is why we often don't do it and because of a recent event in my life that some of you know I have been reflecting back on my life because I I've been reflecting back on my life. And one of the things I have realized reflecting on the last 39 years of my life is that the major turning points of my life have been when faithful men, a couple of them behind me here, have come up to me and rebuked me and corrected me and said, Jason, this is not the way you should go. And I repented and I turned from it and it changed the entire direction of my life life. And, and I just want to begin, I want to continue by reminding us that discipline is not a negative thing. Discipline is a blessing. It's hard, but it's a blessing. It's pastoral to do discipline. And that's what scripture teaches us. I want to read from Hebrews 12, verses 7 through 11. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness." For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields Thank the you. peaceful fruit of righteousness. Thank you. We have Sam Cooper, Peter Hoytema, Larry Lauder. Sam Cooper, Class of Toronto. I speak in against the motion. It seems to me, and I could be wrong, that one of the core values of the reformed expression of the church 
is not unquestioning obedience, but faithful questioning. In that spirit, I'd like to reframe the actions of Neyland Avenue and Classis Grand Rapids East as faithful resistance rather than simply non-compliance. I understand faithful resistance to be an exercise of honoring unity. If our only response to actions taken that are carefully and prayerfully discerned is accountability and discipline, I respectfully submit we risk squelching the Spirit's prophetic movement among us. So, I would like to honor the cost and faithfulness of all those who are resisting, those here, and those across the denomination. Thank you. Okay, Larry, go ahead. I have Larry Lauders. I believe I was I'm sorry, next. Peter. Yeah, thank Peter you so Hoytema, much. Peter Hoytema, Larry Lauders, and uh, Miguel Randall. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I'd like to speak against this motion. Strictly on a logical and tactical level, it makes perfect sense. Based on what we decided this morning, you could say we adopted the principle this morning, and here's the application. Logically, tactically, this makes sense. The dominoes are starting to fall. But this is pastorally very unwise. We need time to process the decisions that we made this morning. We need extended time to engage with LGBTQ plus individuals and their supporters in our communities. I realize that many years have been, have been invested in this already, but based on what we decided this morning, we need more time. Let's pause, let's reflect, let's engage. Yes, as the advisory committee too is recommending, but not this way. I find it interesting. I was born and raised in Hamilton, Ontario, and I knew the acronym HSR long before we came to this synod. HSR is an acronym for Hamilton uh, Street Railway. It's the public transit system. And I think it's, an, it's a helpful comparison because our LGBTQ plus <coughs> family members, friends, congregational members simply want a place to belong. They want to know that their voice is heard, that they are with us. Let's make space for them on the bus. Let's ride this out with them, engaging them, listening to them, correcting them as they correct us. I think this is the way that Jesus operated in the Gospels as he engaged many for whom doctrinal purity was the only lens through which they viewed the world. And as we know from the Gospels, the people those individuals regarded as sinners were incredibly drawn to him. LGBTQ plus individual, individuals are not drawn to us. Why is that? We have not created space for them. We need to do that. I speak against this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just want, want to respond to the comment about how you know, we passed the HSR this morning and now this is just you know, follow-up material. Uh, I want, uh, no, it's not. Uh, you know, the HSR and the, and the Committee 8 were dealing with their own things. We, were, in Committee 2, were dealing with our own things. And so Committee 2 was dealing with something different. We dealt with existing church order uh, 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 principles that were, are still existing in place. And yeah, they, we were working with the principles that we've always been working with. And so, and just a reminder that policy and procedure, uh, it serves the church. When we follow proper procedure and, uh, and our protocols and our church order that protects, it blesses, it serves the unity of the, of the denomination. We do this in our homes, we do this in our businesses, we do this in, in government, everything else. Certainly we should be doing that in the church. It's a blessing when we serve the policies that are in place. Just a reminder, we did have a limit of people speaking twice, so we got others to speak. So this will be your second time, Larry. Um, I, I just clearly don't know how to use the queue. I thought I'd been kicked out, and so I entered accidentally. So I cede the rest of my time and thank the chairman for allowing me extra time the first time. Okay. Miguel Randall? Pass. Pass. John Vanderstoop? Mm -hmm. Dominic Palacios? Okay. Okay, so did Stephen DeBoer, I have Stephen DeBoer, Marsha Hosmar, 
Blake Campbell, Leo Yonker. Oh, Dominic, Dominic. Hang on a second, let's let give. Okay, um, before you can speak, Dominic, there's something that we need to talk to you personally first. Okay. We have a Jason Rice. Did you still oh, no? Okay. Stephen DeBoer and Marsha Hosmer. Go ahead, Stephen. Hi, Steve DeBoer, Classes Niagara. You know, if the gospel is that we, are, we become big by becoming small, sin is pretty big, and at the heart of this is a person. What does this person experience? What does this council experience? I think if we pass this, we're church order wise, and we're tone deaf. I think there's great wisdom in becoming so small that we submit to the suggestion that Larry made from their own council to open themselves to accountability that works its way from the, the smallest point up. Then doing what we're going to do here and work from the top down. I, I think that's the gospel. I think that's us practicing surrendering our power and using our power to its best end. It's, it's practicing what we've been singing and preaching this whole week. I will say that I'm, I'm not neutral to this. Uh, Neeland was my home church for uh, eight years when I was a Kelvin student. Uh, I, uh, I'm proud to say that I was there on Sunday and experienced the gospel lived out. The tension that you're living with is not, you don't deserve an arrow. You deserve to be followed by us that we would learn to live in that tension. And I believe that our denomination, our churches, our campuses, every last bit, the left and the right, will be better for it. I speak against this recommendation. And all that follow, I'll only speak once. Thank you. Marsha Hosmar. Marsha Hosmar, classes Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. President. I speak against this motion. God called this officer to serve, and that officer responded to that calling. God's calling has more authority than the rules made by Synod, and we should not be challenging God's calling on our brother or sister. Blake Campbell and Leo Yonkers. Classes of Leanna speak in favor of the motion. Um, I would like to just make a couple things clear, Mr. Chairman, for all of us, and that is women in office and racial minorities have been mentioned multiple times, cited in relation to Neyland's Ave Le Neyland Avenue as well as the HSR. Again, unless any of us would say differently, Mr. Chairman, which I hope we would not, conflating race, ethnicity, and being a female with homosexual sex and same-sex marriage is a very dangerous place to go. We're also not isolating this particular sin, Mr. Chairman. I believe uh, we're being specific. And what I mean, what I mean by that is, uh, we are referencing a particular case in which one of the sins 
in the HSR was violated by an office bearer. And as of today, we have officially voted to grant this a confessional status and this HSR is what I'm referring to. Also, it's been mentioned a couple times, and I think this is true for all of us, as an office bearer, we are held to a higher standard than the members of our church. James 3, 1 says, my dear brothers and sisters, don't be so eager to become a teacher in the church, since you know that we who teach are held to a higher standard of judgment. Also, Jude 17 through 19 spoke to me as well, but dear brothers, or dear friends, excuse me, remember what the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you in the last times, there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. Mr. Chairman, I'd like all of us to think about this. If this body claims to be a family, then we should not be urging churches and classes to spur the guidance and the decision and the wisdom of this body. Thank you. Um, Leo, and then Robert Tornstra, Daryl DeClerc. May I start? Yes, Okay. Please. So, um, Leo Yonker, Classes Quinty. I, I didn't think I was going to say anything about this particular motion, but now that I've heard some of the discussion, um, I want to pick up something that Lynette started with. The, several times this has been uh, referred to as um, a matter of discipline, and, um, and it looks like a matter of discipline for me, or to me, and um, I do not think that when we do discipline, we should do it without um, a personal connection and discussion and listening to the people involved. So I would suggest, if it is possible in some way, that some people be appointed who are able to listen and to, um, to meet a number of times with the classes, sorry, with the um, council and with the people involved, and then recommend back. Now, I don't know if that would work, but I just don't think it's right for um, to, to do discipline sort of without having any connection to, direct connection to the people involved. That makes me uneasy, so I will therefore vote against it. Robert. Mr. Chair, may I speak for a moment, please? Yes. So I would encourage um, the floor to um, read carefully the wording. Um, as a committee, we worked really, really carefully to ensure that the wording communicated what we want and the word discipline is not, is not found in um, recommendation number one. So I would just strongly urge the floor of synod to note carefully the language that is used. We need to, yes, we do need to speak to the motion. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Rob Tornster from Columbia. <clears throat> I, um, I lament this as well. This has been difficult for me, the discussions on the, to the, on the matter we had before us this morning as well was equally very difficult. Um, I have my convictions and yet it's, um, it's painful. Uh, there's a part of me that wants to maybe look for a way a compromise because I realize that already a great deal of, of pain has resulted from the decisions of this synod. And there's a part of me that says there's only so much we can take in one, uh, in one synod. And so there's a part of me that wants to look for some kind of a compromise. Uh, and perhaps that's still a way out or still a way forward. Yeah. But then I hear thoughts like, well, this is, we're hearing a prophetic voice from Neeland. And I realize that there are some of my brothers and sisters here that take that approach, but that concerns me. And that then leads me back to the sense that I have that says we also need to speak as a church um, against that. And I realize, again, not everyone will agree with that, but, um, but I think one of the reasons we do discipline is to speak against what many have determined to be um, a wrong course of action, a course of action that's inconsistent with, uh, with biblical principles. It's not accurate to say that this is uh, a top-down decision that was initiated all of a sudden. Our church personally um, communicated with Neeland. I know many others have as well. 
in a spirit of, I think, love and um, yeah, Christian, Christian community trying to urge the congregation to rescind its decision, and that has not happened, and that's one of the reasons we find ourselves at this point uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Daryl DeClerc, Matt Borst, and John Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Daryl DeClerc, Classis, BC Southeast. I speak in favor of the motion, and uh, I do want to address that, uh, that the grief that we are feeling here, including the grief that I feel for our colleagues. Um, for 45 years, I've been floating down this river of the CRC in one of the boats, uh, uh, similar to hundreds of thousands of others who've been blessed by this denomination. Neeland Ave is one of those churches with hundreds of members blessed and so we know that this church has effective local ministry and, um, and and has been a gift to so many and we covenanted together to live and minister together under the banner of a confessional denomination they knew the process for engaging in this uh, in, in any change in life and doctrine and didn't follow it uh, and i want to address the point of of changed precedent. Uh, one brother mentioned if we uh, change precedent, if we don't act now, we set the precedent that any church can change anything of their doctrine in life uh, without the, the appropriate process for engaging together. And then synods in the future are just putting out one thing after another or addressing one thing after the next uh, in, in a constant stream. I also, Mr. Chairman, want to address a common misperception and mischaracterization uh, and then especially for those um, uh, who will hear from us about these deliberations, I prayed with the pastor of Neil and Av last night. I skipped dinner to worship with the dear people who came here yesterday uh, and continued to speak with them after. Um, members of this community are always welcome and loved by us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Matt Borst, John Lee. Matt Borst, Class of Pacific Northwest. Um, my question is uh, more about the, the, the process that we're taking right now and the precedent that we're talking about. And I appreciate the, the uh, committee reporter's uh, reference to, to good process being a blessing for the whole church. Uh, one of the reasons I'm at Classis right now is because I'm a synodical deputy and I will represent Synod at various Classis meetings, oftentimes in very difficult situations. As a Classis clerk, as stated clerk, I've also uh, pushed judicial code to the limits of what Synod could handle in past years. And so the, the process is very near and dear to my heart. When, the, when this came up today, I was surprised. I, I know that there's a precedent for doing this, but it's a small precedent. And I know that the greater precedent for Synod is to not do this. I know this came up in 1988. It was a big deal. It was um, cited again in 2015 at a heavy uh, topic. And it was even published in the manual for CRC government, which is church order geek people love to read, pages 275 and 276. But I didn't bring my copy with me. Um, but since we're not dealing with like a, 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 an Article 30, you know, a judicial code, I'm wondering what the procedure is, if somebody could speak to it maybe, because we have in our, um, in our um, church order commentary right, a warning that a careful study of the history of the CRCNA reveals some serious incidents where just treatment was definitely lacking, even when that is allowed to happen for some supposed greater good, uh, the protection of true reformed doctrine from heresy, for instance. Right? But the scriptures are clear that we are not to show partiality or favoritism under any circumstances. And so we have these dire warnings for us as a body. And I'm wondering if either Kathy Smith or somebody could speak to uh, why this process and not something like a judicial code or what led up to this. Are you asking Kathy Smith to address us? Uh, yes, Kathy Smith. Thank you. Um, well, that, there was a lot there, Mr. Chairman. Um, as far as uh, the last thing mentioned, judicial code, that's an appeal procedure. 
for a decision um, that an assembly has made, and that's not what this is about. This decision, if this recommendation were to be adopted, would be appealable, so someone could appeal this decision afterward. As far as um, what Matt helpfully quoted from the manual, which quotes from, as, as he noted, I'm very impressed, 1988 and 2015. Yes, Synod did say in both of those years that Synod does not reach in and impose discipline on a local congregation, on their office bearers, except upon appeal. So the normal procedure is that if a disciplinary matter is questioned in a local church, someone from that local church could appeal the council's decision to classes, and classes, and if then the appeal was not sustained, could appeal that decision of classes to synod. And that has been done as recently as 2019. That is the ordinary process. In this particular case, Neeland Avenue's council made a decision, but there has not been an appeal to bring that to this body. So this recommendation is a very different process from what is our ordinary process and from what Synod itself has cited, as noted in 1988 and 2015, and perhaps in other places. And I will say that um, this information um, I also offered to the advisory committee. Thank you. John Lee. William Wilton. David Bosher. John Lee, classes me, myself, and Iacota. I've been trying to listen well for the past couple of days. Um, I'm going to indulge. I'm not going to actually speak to the motion. I'm, I'm going to make an observation. What we do is important. We've just heard from Kathy about process. We've been talking about process. I think what matters is how we do it. And um, if anything we do doesn't come from love and a sense of shared brokenness, um, we're not going to do the right thing. But I do think you can vote for this motion or against it with that same sense. So I don't want to put that in either of the camps. But I want to just note to this body, I don't think we're really listening to each other, even though we're talking a whole lot. Like we say, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, and yet when, some, when a body is, makes a decision, you have to kick us out because we're not going to listen. Or, well, we're going to do this, um, and we're not going to listen to you. If we're just going to keep talking past each other, Mr. President, then I think we're doing more harm to the people I want to center, which are the vulnerable. And if we're saying, if you believe that those of us who teach a traditional understanding of marriage are causing harm, blood in our hands, toxic theology, bad fruit, then how dare, because we went to seminary, will you stay in unity with me if I'm causing harm to the vulnerable? And if those of us believe what we say, that those who are on the other side aren't calling people to Christ and to die to themselves and to find life where life is found in the voice of the beloved, how dare we stay in unity with each other if we're allowing you to cause harm? So either let's not make the arguments we're making, or please may we listen to one another. And may we listen to the word of God together in humility. And I guess I just want to make the observation, I don't think we're doing that as well as we should. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. William Wilton and David Bosher. And finally, Dan Hoagland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. William Wilton, Classes Columbia. I speak in favor of the motion, and I hope I can do so lovingly and supporting people that I disagree with and who disagree with me. I believe that this is about Reformed Church polity and that it is biblical mutual accountability. And that's what we do in the Christian Reformed Church. That's what we do in the Reformed tradition. This is not a top-down decision. This is not a precedent. We did the same thing, virtually the same thing, the first synod I attended in 2005 with the situation in Classes Toronto. But of course, this doesn't mean or preclude that Neelan or Grand Rapids East or any one of us cannot or should not uh, be loving to people from every community. Doesn't mean that they, this deacon even needs to stop loving or serving uh, her community 
or doing benevolence in the name of Jesus Christ. But we are called to judge the calling of other office bearers. A number of people have said we are not called and we cannot judge the calling of people's callings. Can't judge that. Of course we can and we should. We're instructed to do so. We do it at the local level, we do it at the classist level, and we do it at the synodical level. We're going to judge people and approve them and recognize them, whether it's a call to the seminary or the appointment as an elder or deacon in our local congregations. We do that in every level of the church, and we should. This motion is about a covenantal relationship, and that was violated. We just want that put back in right order. It's about reformed church governance. It's about mutual accountability. Thank you. David Bosher. Uh, David Bosher, class is Thornapple Valley. Um, I speak in favor of the motion. And I guess I would support it with a rhetorical question. Um, do we have preferences or do we have positions? What is it that we put all this work into deliberating over? I have a friend of mine who constantly used to tell me that uh, I, I should be pastoring a non-denominational church. And I would go on about mutual accountability and he would go on about how much couldn't get done. He retired two years ago, and the pastor that followed, because he was not under mutual accountability, had, had the church basically off the rails inside of a year. When I'm counseling young men to be pastors and young women who want to be pastors, um, this is one of the things I bring up about why it is that I'm here in the Christian Reformed Church. I'm here for the mutual accountability. I want to know that if I'm, I'm running off the rails, someone is going to come and talk to me. And indeed, I thank God for faithful mentors and pastors who have. And additionally, if I'm going to put in a life of sacrifice and work for a church, I want to know that the pastor will be themselves a person under authority after I go, so that my work of building a community in God's glory will not be in jeopardy of false teaching. Do, do we have positions or do we have preferences? I think that's what's at stake right here. And if the answer is preferences, then I would submit that we're spending an awful lot more time here than we really need to on everything that we deliberate over. Go ahead, Dan. Dan Hoagland, uh, Classes Eastern Canada. I speak against uh, the recommendation. Uh, when I provide guidance to my children, I have five children, I do so with warmth, uh, gentleness, and an appropriate amount of firmness. And I do this in the context of a loving relationship uh, that seeks their flourishing. I don't direct them using a hammer. And this recommendation suggests that we use a hammer. My kids are gonna be here tomorrow, first time on Calvin's campus. They're gonna join Synod for a little while. And uh, you know what, I, I mean, I'm glad they're not here today but I speak against the motion. Those are all the speakers in the queue. Now we go to the vote. Ken, would you like to read the motion again so everybody's clear on what we're voting for? So the motion is that Synod instruct Neelan Avenue Christian Reformed Church to immediately rescind its decision to ordain a deacon in a same-sex marriage, thus nullifying this deacon's current term. Those in favor say aye. Aye. That's all? Yes. Let's go with a yes, no vote. Electronic.
Mr. Chair, if I may, can I ask that you read the for and against the amount of each vote, please? You may ask. I'll give you an answer in just a moment. Thank you, sir. Kathy, may I? Just for information, if you would like to register a negative vote, please wait until the vote results are announced. Thank you.
All right, your attention, please. The vote was 134 yes, 44 no. Motion passes. We are going to go ahead and take a break, but when we come back, it will be open session, and we need to deal with 1B. So when we come back, it'll be 1B. We'll come back to this one later, and it will be open session. And so. All right, then we're, we're, we'll go ahead and take a break right now.
<laughs> that works if the mic doesn't. Please sit down. Time to come back. Everybody, please have a seat. Okay, please have a seat, everybody. We are about to, to start. And uh, Daryl, the clerk, I think he's got cold water in that thing if you're not sitting down. <laughs> um, Luann has something to say. Besides, if you don't sit down, you might miss your wonderful prize. Resources, and it goes to Ari Venek. Ari Venek. Well, you won something today, and it's heavy, so be careful. Raise Up Ministries is giving this wonderful set of books to Rick Admiral. Rick Admiral. Thank you. I have a wonderful Calvin mug for, or glass. I won't say what you're going to put into this glass, but. Jeff Bazine. And this to me seems like a wonderful, wonderful set of stuff. It goes to Jake Van Dam from the Barnabas Fund. How foundation. Barnabas Fund. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be balancing that mug on the top. There you go. Thank you, guys. Okay, let's continue. I have a number of negative votes. Miguel Randall, on the grounds that Neyland Avenue CRC is follow where God is leading them. It is hypocritical to claim that the process don't matter when it suits us. <clears throat> but simultaneously claim others must follow every process or they are wrong. This is yet another attack on the LGBT community. We are saying yet again that a group doesn't belong. We were wrong when we did it in regards to the segregation. We were wrong when we did it in regards to interracial marriage. We were wrong <clears throat> with preventing women to hold office. We are wrong here. Every 45 seconds, an LGBTQ plus youth attempts suicide. We don't have many more seconds left. <coughs> Negative vote from Rebecca Jordan Hayes. Grounds, this is unwise and unprecedented action of synod in response to the decision of a congregation. Negative vote by Anthony Ellenbus. Um, grounds, none given. Negative vote by Stephen DeBoer. The, there is a better, more redemptive way to work through this. Sally Larson, negative vote. Grounds, the normal procedure of synod getting involved only after an appeal should be followed. Any action with Neela needs to be covered with love, respect, compassion. <clears throat> Marsha Hosmar, negative vote. Grounds, none given. 
Alice Juicy, negative vote. Grounds, it appears the COD did not follow typical protocols in initiating a letter of admonition, and Senate is doing the same, coming in with a top-down, heavy-handed approach when they have not developed a relationship with Neyland Avenue Church. The action lacks pastoral tone. Barb Baldheis, negative vote, grounds. This action violates the church order and the direct instruction of previous synods. <clears throat> Heidi Saitsema, this action will harm the ministry of the people in Neyland in their church and neighborhood. Patricia Borgdorf, grounds, church order was not followed, more effective ways to address concerns at a local level. And the last one that I have here is from Donna Anima. Grounds, this appeal should have come from, the member, from a member of Neyland. This was out of church order and therefore very hurtful. Those are all the negative votes that I have at this point. I will have to relinquish the chair once again, but I want to thank Derek for the work that he's doing. It's not easy. I love you, brother. I love you all. Are we allowed? You may. <laughs> You're a rock star. Glad to be back. Let's try to do this one in under nine hours this time. Actually, we have to do this before we can examine Zach King this evening. That interview is scheduled for, not, for 7 p.m. And so we're going to have to uh, work until this is done now. And so I don't want to say many words. I just want to hand things over to our reporter from Advisory Committee 1 who is going to walk us through his report on synodical services and structure. This is 1B. I also just want to give you, uh, I want to let you know that when we get to his recommendations, he's going to first walk through all of them or just two? Just two. Just two. When we come to two, what he's going to do is he's going to take the whole of two together, but he's going to, if, as you take a look at two, there are a lot of like A, B, C, D, E, He's going to walk through those and allow for questions from the body as we come to each question so that everyone is aware of what we're voting on. Now that's a little unusual, but it's, we think it's the most effective way to make sure everyone's on the same page as we approach voting. And so I'm going to turn things over now to the reporter. Please present to us your report. Thank you so much, Mr. President. On behalf of Committee One, I am reporting. I trust that you've had an opportunity to, uh, to look at Advisory Committee Report 1B. If you're like me, you perhaps find it challenging to transition from what we were talking about yesterday and this morning into this, but uh, it's what, uh, what we're called to do and there is some sense of urgency in getting this done today. So just some introductory comments there was a lot of material for our committee to look at, and this is a theme that we've heard from other advisory committees already, uh, largely due to the cancellation of two previous synods. So the materials are all there, itemized in the report, um, and our recommendations are based on those materials from all of those different sources. But I think I need to point out that the wording of our recommendations are not exactly the wording that's found in these materials. The places and the three sources are indicated, but you won't find, in some cases, the exact wording there. It's important to remember that we had to work with material that covered three years of development, reflection, and proposals, and what we now know as the SALT report developed over time. And so the fact that Synod did not meet in 2020 and 2021 uh, delayed the processing of this report. There was no opportunity to engage with churches and classes, and so that speaks to some of the uh, change in, in the language. So our recommendations are very much grounded in the resources, but some of the wording is different. I'd also like to add this comment. When our committee began to do its work, we found that the diversity of opinions and the range of emotional responses to the SALT report that are present in the denomination, and particularly in Canada, were also evident and present among the membership of our committee. There were many 
myself included, who came to uh, the committee work with questions. The content that we were dealing with, the way all of this was processed, there was some level of ambivalence and even confusion and frustration that was present. And some of us came wanting to hit the pause button and have some more time to reflect on the complexities of this uh, presentation. And yet the truly reassuring and, and amazing part of our work over the past few days was to see how we as a committee all landed in the same place. It was a really marvelous thing. And our report and its recommendations are here unanimously adopted. I think that's worth noting and celebrating. And I'd also like to say that a significant reason for this consensus relates to the very competent role that our chairperson, Joel Vanderwerken, played. He did an incredible job. I want to just take note of that and celebrate that. Thank you, Joel. As uh, for my role as a reporter, I came into this role with significant concerns. I wasn't sure how I would be able to competently explain all of the intricacies of this report. As I shared with the committee, the realm of corporate structure and governance is not one in which I inhabit comfortably. And I also need to share with you at this particular moment that perhaps like many of you, I come into this conversation somewhat physically and emotionally spent. But here we are. When I thought about the report that would come before you, I thought about something that Charles Spurgeon once said about preaching. It's a good word for preachers. It's a good word for those who listen to sermons. And when I mentioned it to uh, Joel, the chairperson of our advisory committee, he said, you should lead with that. That's a, that's a good thing. Here's what Spurgeon said, the eminently quotable Charles Spurgeon. If there's a mist in the pulpit, there will be fog in the pew. <laughs> I know we're not sitting in pews here, but you get the point. And uh, as I shared with the committee, I don't want there to be any mist in this pulpit, because if there is, there will be fog out there. And I was reminded of that quote, even as we broke for our, our mealtime gatherings for lunch and dinner, because there, when I was getting my beverage, you know, there are a number of options presented there, and there, lo and behold, is Sierra Mist. I love Sierra Mist. It was my go-to soda during my 11 years in New Jersey. You can't get it in Canada. And so I was looking so forward to drinking Sierra Mist, and then I felt so conflicted. No mist, no mist. There can't be any mist. I have a little, uh, you know, I think it's good at this point that we take a moment to laugh, given what we've been talking about. So I have a little, uh, little can of Sierra Mist here with me. But it's not Sierra Mist. I took my Sharpie and I wrote Synodical Mist. <laughs> and I'm just going to set it right there. And I'm going to try really hard not to open that can of Synodical Mist. Because if there's going to be Synodical Mist here in the pulpit, there's going to be a lot of Synodical fog out there. And we've got to try to avoid that. And I'm very grateful for the help that others on the committee provided in the drafting of this report that you have before you. I want to especially acknowledge Scott and John and, again, our chairperson. Part of the reason the preparation of our report took considerable time is that in addition to all of the administrative complexity that we're dealing with, we recognized significant pastoral work, too. And this relates to the overtures that we'll speak about in time. There is significant pastoral concern, hurt and frustration that we acknowledged and wanted somehow to address. I'm reminded of a quote, perhaps you've heard it from Flannery O'Connor, and I think in light of what we have been thinking and talking about yesterday and today, it's particularly apt. Sometimes you have to suffer as much from the church as for it. We understand and affirm the hurt and frustration that many people felt as a result of the SALT process, the SALT report. We read the overtures that expressed that. We acknowledge the challenges associated with the lack of ecclesiastical process to engage appropriately with churches and individuals. But we as a committee truly feel that our recommendations go a long way to provide a good way forward for ministry in our binational denomination. And so with that, I'd like to read the background that introduces our report and its recommendations. If I may read the background, Mr. President, at this time? Yes, you may. Okay, thank you. Your advisory committee of synodical services and structure has spent a great deal of time considering the matter of the structure and leadership task force report, the SALT report. 
receiving significant input from Andy DeRyder and Michael Tenhaken on behalf of the Council of Delegates and in their respective roles as the Canadian and U.S. corporate officers, as well as Al Postma and Terry Veldboom, senior level Canadian staff. We acknowledge the disruption of the pandemic as well as significant personnel changes and the reality of Canada Revenue Agency tax compliance issues. I just want to comment that was a key impetus in the development of the SALT report. The recognition that tax exempt status was very much in jeopardy in Canada and uh, that we were not currently legally in compliance with the Canada Revenue Agency tax uh, compliance rules. So this is what we requ required the COD to move forward with some changes without the ordinary engagement with churches and classes due to the cancellation of Synods 2020 and 2021. This was unfortunate and we recognize the pain that has resulted from this delay. This frustration and pain was evident in the overtures and communications sent to Synod by a significant number of the Canadian classes. While different structures will admittedly not on their own fully resolve this pain, it is our hope and prayer that within these new structures, some of the challenges of creating a healthy binational ministry can be more effectively addressed. In our deliberations, it quickly became clear that the work of the Structure and Leadership Task Force did not end with their 2021 report to the Council of Delegates. Indeed, the COD and the Structure and Leadership Implementation Team has explored even further changes in the intervening months many of which address the concerns outlined by both the Canadian Catalytic Conversation January 2022 and in several of the overtures presented to Synod 2022. Our recommendations have taken into account all of the information from multiple sources, including the COD, overtures, the agenda for Synod and its supplement, and other materials, which have outlined the evolution and improvements to the structure and leadership we trust that this growth will continue as the CRCNA lives into its new structure and makes adjustments and, in, and improvements. However, we don't want to allow the challenges of the process to undermine the quality of the final results before us. As a committee, we believe that the proposed structure and leadership aligns with originally stated goals and also enables Synod 2022 to move forward based on our stated organizational values, partnership, collaboration, cooperation, shared mission, and interdependence between countries, ministry institutions, agencies, programs, and partners. Chief among the developments that the COD and the CRCNA have implemented is the creation of a new executive leader for the CRCNA U.S. Corporation. This position is the director of U.S. Ministry Operations. Organizationally, this person is the counterpart to the executive director Canada who correspondingly reports to the CRCNA Canada Corporation. This revised structure is reflected in the diagram of legal corporations found below, which was adapted from the diagram in the Agenda for Synod supplement on page 25. Note that this chart only reflects legal corporations and doesn't fully reflect the interconnected nature of ministry relationships. That chart is a very helpful one, at least it was for me and for our committee members and it's something that I won't say anything more about now. Um, I think as we make our way through our recommendations, particularly number two, it will become more clear to us. So do keep that uh, chart in mind. Another significant development has been the further clarification of joint ministry agreements. These agreements will create role clarity, responsibility and accountability between ministry boards, leaders and partners including between the CRCNA Canada Corporation and the CRCNA U.S. Corporation. Additionally, our two countries will remain united ecclesiastically through the coordinating efforts of the Office of General Secretary, which will be housed in a newly created separate legal entity. In all of this, we highly value binationality and the continued unity of our denomination. While we recognize that heartache, frustration, and pain have been felt along the way, we are hopeful that this new structure and leadership will place the CRCNA in a strong position to move forward and confidently share the gospel. And so with that, Mr. President, I'd like us to make our way through the recommendations. We can vote on recommendation one as it is before us, but as I said, when we get to two, we'll work through that piece by piece. It sounds good to me. Recommendation number one, that Synod take note of the work of the COD to propose a new denominational structure in light of Canadian charitable law requirements, 
as well as the more recent work to develop a new executive leader for the CRCNA US Corporation. And the ground, this work significantly clarifies the relative roles of the CRCNA as an ecclesiastical body, the CRCNA Canada Corporation, and the CRCNA US Corporation. I so move. Do I hear a second? Any discussion? Oh, I realize the speaker queue, I do not believe it's open. Now it is open. Now I get to know if anybody's trying to get in. Seeing none, are we ready to vote? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, recommendation two is really the heart of what we are recommending, and so uh, we'll make our way through that and vote on it once we have done that. Number so, two. So uh, if I just may have a word, yes. I think the most effective way for us to do this is you were hoping that we would have time for questions. And so I'm gonna ask that the speaker queue um, stay open while we work our way through here. And if you have a question, um, you can go into the speaker queue to ask that question after any point. Does that work for you, Peter, if we do it that way? Yes, that's fine. Now, keep in mind, we're not deliberating on any motion. This is to answer any questions, recognizing that we don't want to open that can of synodical mist. Yes, don't open this can. That, that's very important. <laughs> Great. Well, Peter, why don't you take us through, and then you pause and let me know when you're ready to take questions, and that's when we'll open the speaker queue if there are any. Okay, so I will read recommendation 2A, the recommendation and A. That Synod address the following recommendations with regard to the work of the COD in response to the report of the Structure and Leadership Task Force. And then A, that Synod affirm the following goals and acknowledge these challenges to improve CRCNA culture. Number one, Affirm that we desire a binational organizational culture shaped by partnership, collaboration, cooperation, shared mission, and interdependency between countries, ministry institutions, agencies, programs, and partners. Board members and leaders will be selected who affirm these cultural values. Number two, acknowledge the ongoing challenges the CRCNA organization faces in resolving the Canada Revenue Agency compliance issues in Canada, and recognize that the implementation of the recommendations in the SALT report must address these issues, but should not unduly impact the CRCNA organizational culture. I will take comments and questions now. Let me see if anybody comes into the speaker queue. I see no questions, continue on. To be that Synod take the following actions with respect to the formation of a separate legal entity to house the ecclesiastical office to be known as the Office of General Secretary of the CRCNA. And again, I would just refer you back to that chart at this point so you see clearly what we are talking about. It is that circle in the middle of the chart that we are addressing here. Uh, B1, endorse the formation of this separate legal entity. Note the work that has been done on the certificate of incorporation and bylaws of what has tentatively been called the Worldwide Christian Reformed Church and receive the accompanying Christian Reformed Church Ecclesial and Ministry Organizational Views document as background regarding the new corporation. And then two, instruct the Council of Delegates Executive Committee to review the proposed articles of, of incorporation and bylaws for this new ecclesiastical corporation and make the necessary changes to bring the articles of incorporation and bylaws into harmony with each other, as well as with the Council of Delegates Governance Handbook, and to consider a new name for the ecclesiastical corporation before presenting these documents for final approval by the Council of Delegates. Uh, just a note there, our advisory committee was not overly thrilled with the name Worldwide Christian Reformed Church, which is why we're recommending that they at least reflect on the possibilities of finding a new name for that. Three, adopt the establishment of the senior leadership positions of General Secretary and Chief Administrative Officer, as well as the Office of General Secretary, to be governed by the new legal entity, entity tentatively called the Worldwide Christian Reformed Church. I will take comments and questions if there are some. Let me see if there are any questions. If you have any, please put your name in the speaker queue.
I'm not seeing anyone in the speaker queue, so please continue. Ah, uh, there's one. So Harold, why don't you come and ask your question? Yes, uh, Harold Caicedo, California South. Uh, it's not exactly the question. Uh, it's something that I want to say for the A, A part or something like that. The decide to be binational uh, organization. Uh, actually, I think in the last year, we are talking about not to be like just binational organization. We are trying to be like multicultural or at least or international or global organization, something like that. So the Consejo Latino uh, is working in that direction. So I think it's, it's the future for, for us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that comment. We are presently committing ourselves to retain the binationality of our denomination, but with a view to expanding that, which is why the worldwide uh, Christian Reformed Church is, is there to consider the possibility, at least, that it may become a multinational uh, reality. Darwin. Darwin Glassford, Classes Holland. Can you speak to the financial cost of this for salaries and other related expenses and how you plan to address that in a time of declining ministry shares? I cannot speak to that. I'd have to defer to someone who uh, can speak more competently on the uh, financial matters. I see Andy is standing up, so he has privilege of the floor. I'll defer to him. There really is not a significant cost increase. Um, John Bolt is retiring as uh, Colin Watson is retiring. Zach will move into that uh, old office. CAO will move into John's old office. Uh, we're not making any new positions here. So the cost, there's not a huge cost. We're not, even the uh, new office of general secretary and its new entity will just take people from other positions. So there's not a lot of extra cost at all whatsoever, except some of the legal costs to set these things up, but no significant cost increases at all. There will be a lot of positions that are here now that are going to be eliminated, and those, the money that was used for those positions will be used for the new positions. Continue. Okay, turning to... Oh, before you do, two people just hopped on. Daryl? And then hope is on deck. Sorry, this is not real time. It takes a couple of seconds. So, Daryl DeClerc, uh, classes BC Southeast. Uh, if I, I don't see uh, much in the way of the governance office, which was uh, in the original documents that we wrote, and maybe you could just explain uh, where that was coming or going, or uh, yeah. maybe I missed something. That's coming in the next piece that I will read from C, governance office. Um, just a question about the new legal entity that's being created. In which country will it be housed? That may be addressed later, but. Yeah, you want me to answer that? It's, in which country is the new legal entity, the, what was the worldwide Christian Reformed Church in this document? It's being incorporated in the U.S., and that was for legal simplicity, um, as I understand it. That's correct, Andy? That, that's correct. And I'm gonna, I made a fool of myself the committee because I keep thinking New Jersey and Delaware are the same, but it's in one of those two because that's where a lot of these corporations are done. I, excuse me, but um, I'm from the West Coast. I don't get out that way very often. What, and and since both Peter and I have lived in New Jersey, we made sure we took due offense to that. Okay. The due offense is noted. Are there other speakers? We have Jason Rice who would like to ask a question. Uh, Jason Rice, Class of Wisconsin. Just uh, curious what uh, Andy DeRider had mentioned that the Office of General Secretary would include the General Secretary, Chief Administrative Officer, and would bring in some other positions. Uh, I'd be just be curious what other positions would be part of the office.
I'll take a first crack at that and then Andy can uh, add to anything that I say. Um, this is primarily kind of a, a reshuffling of things within uh, what might now be kind of synodical service kinds of things. We're looking for the things that are managing the kind of the binational character of the denomination and joining the U.S., you know, kind of yeah, managing the, the U.S. and Canadian partnerships um, and, uh, you know, just kind of overlooking the governance of the denomination as a whole. You want to add anything to that, Andy? Yeah, it, it's offices like the, uh, the Synodical Secretary's Office, it's CRC Publications, um, Kristen's, Kristen's work, those kind of things will be in the office of the General Secretary. I believe that there is another person who is requesting the floor for a question, so you can go for it. Uh, there it is, Corey from Classes Georgetown. Just a clarification on that one, something that was helpful to me. So. Uh, the things that are going to the Office of General Secretary are more ecclesial in nature. And then for the corp, right, the legal entities, that was the more administrative execution things in that category. So, so that was really helpful for me to understand why it's, we don't have the, the U.S. corp doesn't have an executive director uh, because some of that is separate and then the, the needs of the two were different. So, so ecclesial, for, think of that for... General Secretary. So I think page 312 in the deferred agenda has the description of the Office of Governance, kinds of, what kinds of things are in there. I don't see any other questions, so continue. Okay, so C addresses uh, the governance issue. That Synod instruct the Office of General Secretary to develop protocols to improve and strengthen the governance framework and design of the CRCNA organization as part of the Office of General Secretary. There was, as already originally or previously mentioned, some reference to an Office of Governance, and we found that to be a little or, or potentially confusing, where people would think that this is another office, a separate office that's being established, similar to, for instance, the Office of Synodical Services. And uh, we really think that this is more of a task or a responsibility than it is an office, and it will probably uh, be taken care of by the general secretary and perhaps others. But we're basically um, not recognizing it as an office, but as a task that uh, will, will be taken uh, care of in the uh, office and by the office of general secretary. I hope that's clear. So any comments or questions on that? Yeah, Daryl. Daryl the Clark, Class BC Southeast again. I can learn to say that quite quickly now. Um, I'm just wondering if the governance aspects there would now work to resolve proactively some of the questions that we dealt earlier with the dismissal of the executive director, uh, ex, uh, the previous executive director of uh, the Canadian Corp. Uh, sorry, of, of Canadian, the Canadian Ministries director. I believe that, that, that uh, governance primarily addresses issues such related to bylaws, board membership recruitment, but uh, Andy would have some more to say on that. Yeah, all these corporate, it's quite normal in the corporate world to have governance, and the Canadian board is also going to get a, uh, an office of governance uh, that will control more of those issues to make sure the Canadian board acts appropriately. So that'll happen on the Canadian side. This will be primarily for the Office of General Secretary, the governance. That'll cover the American side, so. Leo, you can ask your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Leo Van Tool, Classes Niagara. Um, we're talking now actually about the diagram. The diagram Basically. is a resource. We're talking yeah. specifically um, about. When I look at that, I guess my see. question is, does it change the responsibilities of this synod over against the organization of the CRCNA? In other words, do we have less responsibility, more responsibility? That, that, that looked a little bit like we're only controlling that center circle about the general secretary and have no say in it. It looks like they're just hanging out there as satellites, and I just wondered if you could answer that. My understanding is that the role of synod will not be impacted by this, uh, by this change. It will remain in its function going forward as it always has, as an ecclesial um, 
body. Anyone else have a question? All right, I th I th you're good to go. Okay, uh, moving to D, that Synod acknowledge the revised role of the CRC in a Canada Corporation and take note that the CRC in a Canada Corporation has revised their charter and bylaws to be in compliance with Canada Revenue Agency regulations and also take note of the appointment of the new Director of U.S. Ministry Operations for the CRCNA U.S. Corporation as a counterpart to the Executive Director Canada. That word counterpart is a key word there. These are not the same positions in every respect, uh, but they are counterparts in the new proposed structure. And I will take comments or questions if there are any. Yeah, let's see if there are any questions. If you put your name in the queue, if you could just raise your hand so I could. Doesn't look to be any questions. Can, oh, now there is one. There are two. Uh, Jason Cross in class in BC, uh, class BC Southeast. Um, <clears throat> I spent a fair bit of time reading through this report. And for me, and as we're going through all this, uh, the question's kind of been looming. Uh, I guess there's been a couple issues that came up. There was a cultural issue, um, and then there's the issue with the um, the, uh, the CRA, um, and it it address. It, I understand how that, that you guys are going to make this work for the CRA. I'm wondering how this new structure is going to address cultural issue, issues. Like, yeah. like I, I'm wondering if uh, there is outside. Um, expertise that was consulted, like a cons like some type of consultant um, that would help in in this process, like the process of we've got new names and we've shuffled things around. But I'm wondering if that's going to help with the culture. Uh, like we, we've had a, a number of executive directors leave, and um, so yeah, I'll, I'll say something, and then I think our uh, chairperson has something to say. As we acknowledge in the report, no structural organizational presentation is going to address cultural yeah. or fix cultural mm -hmm, issues. Mm -hmm. There are cultural issues there. Yeah. We do feel this is going to be a better structure and system to address some of the concerns that we have previously come up against. Yeah. Um, so it's just something that we're going to have to implement and see how that works. And if there are any concerns that come up, this is a better way to address and, and deal with those. Yeah. No, I, I recognize it. it definitely addresses the issues of the CRA and that, but I just wasn't sure. Yeah, but it goes Other beyond just the CRA. The culture, how, how, what, like if we have a plan on moving forward, how we intend to um, improve the culture, other than saying we want to improve the culture. Yeah. Can I address that? Yep. You want me to take it, let me take it, you want me to take a crack at it, Andy, and then you can, you can follow up with my comments. Sure. I think one of the things that our committee heard is that within the current structure, as it, as it plays out right now, uh, it's clear that who the executive director is for Canada. It's clear who that, that official is. Um, Colin here uh, wears two hats. Uh, as we heard the other day, he walks on water too, but that's a whole different thing. Um, but, but Colin's role is both the, the ecclesiastical head of the denomination, but also the legal head of the U.S. corporation. And what this new structure does is to distinguish between those two roles so it's yeah. clear when he's standing and when the person is standing in which role. Um, the new general secretary doesn't have to fill both those roles. The general secretary is the head of the ecclesiastical organization, and there's a separate individual designated as the legal head of the, the U.S. corporation. And it just it saves the conflation of those two roles and I think makes the structure that much more clear. So we're not trying to figure out who Colin is when, or his successor yeah. is yeah. when they're playing that role. Does that answer your question? Uh, I definitely saw the benefit to that for sure. I thought that was wise. I just, in terms of the cultural problem, like if there's like I didn't see a plan of how it was going to be, like the cultural or the cult. The, or maybe that's the the plan, but I I just wasn't sure if that was going to fix the culture. I mean I, I think maybe I'll take a real quick at it and then Andy can jump in. I, I think the idea is by separating those two roles in the U.S. side, it's clear what the U.S. side is is and what the Canada side is, and then the two countries can kind of work through their joint ministry agreements to. Okay to contextualize ministry properly in, in whichever side of the border they're working. You want to add to that, Andy? Yeah, you might remember that Brother Al here 
was hired as the tradition, uh, transitional executive director. Mm -hmm. A big part of his job in this two to three year appointment will be looking at culture, will be rebuilding relationships, will be rebuilding trust. Okay. That's where the program, once this is approved uh, by Synod, then we can start on those next steps. Okay. So that's definitely part of the program that's coming forward that and a lot good. more classes involvement in how we move forward in that. Okay, thank you. Go for it, David. Um, yeah, I just wondering if you could talk about uh, the conversation that happened and the reason for the name of the U.S., like um, the reasoning for having an executive director of Canada and then a director of U.S. Ministry Operations rather than two executive directors. What's the reasoning for that? Yeah, that uh, question has come up. Why not two identical names for these uh, counterpart positions? And uh, Joel, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think one of the big reasons, as I understood it from our conversations, is that the current position that, it, that Colin fills is the executive director position. And one of the things that we wanted, to, that the COD wanted to avoid in this process was kind of thinking of that existing position. And so, and, and the, the roles are, are a little bit different because the ministry structure is a little bit different on both sides of the border. Um, so that was maybe an unfortunate thing, not blaming anybody for it, but it's the, because the names are different, it might give the impression that they're two, not, they're not counterpart offices, but they are counterpart offices. And uh, the report, I think, makes that pretty clear. Does that answer your question? It's a name thing, not a, anything else to add to that? Like. Michael, you can also speak to this. Thank you. Um, just, yeah, I think Joel summarized that pretty, pretty well there. The, this is a role that's going to be filled, actually, and I can, I think he's here. Joel Heiser is going gonna, is gonna to fill that role for us on behalf of the U.S. Corporation as a director, director of U.S. Ministry Operations. And so it's in a, it, we talked about not adding new positions and that kind of thing. This is in addition to his, uh, his existing role. And, and it's a different type of a role than, than is required or needed in, in Canada. And so that's hence the different name, uh, partly to avoid some of that confusion, provide some clarity there. Um, and partly just to name exactly what we're asking this person to do, which is, again, a little bit different. Uh, the U.S. context is different than the Canadian context in terms of what it needs or requires for that position. Scott from Eastern Canada has a question. Uh, less of a question, Mr. Chair, and more of just a, a thought uh, that I think might be helpful. The joint ministry agreements that are, you can see on the diagram, are kind of tying together the Canada Corp and the U.S. Corp will, I think, really go to the question of culture that has, has been raised that will really help with the complexity of contextualizing ministry in either country. Uh, and it will also set out specific, they will set out specific goals and understandings. So I think it will really help the two sides of our denomination, the two countries are currently represented in our denomination to have that kind of ongoing dialogue in a way that is transparent, that's open, that people will understand so that hopefully in the future we don't run into miscommunications about goals or, or ministry uh, agendas or anything like that. So the joint ministry agreements I think are, are an extremely important and really helpful uh, piece of the new structure that will help improve the culture uh, in the denomination and in the legal structures of the denom denomination as well. Robert? Robert Van Zan in uh, Thornapple Valley. Um, just curious, names uh, are you know coming into this conversation. So there's a general secretary in the RCA. Uh, there's also a secretary general in the UN. But if you search general secretary, you don't get the RCA. You get the Communist Party and um, <laughs> Soviet Union and China. Um, you know, so there might be some negative connotations with that name. So just curious if we've thought about that. I'm sure you guys have talked about titles quite a bit. <laughs> We did not do a Google search, but thank you. 
for that observation. No doubt this will change it all. If you search it, you know, a few months from now, it'll be all CRC all the way down. <laughs> all right. Continue. Okay, so we are now at D. Uh, sorry, E, which refers to the ecclesiastical mandate letter. There were, um, there's more than one version of this, and so just to be clear, the one that we are referring to here is one that you can find on page 19 of the agenda supplement. And this is a document that is provided only if the Canada Revenue Agency requests it. So I'll read E. That Synod adopt the ecclesiastical mandate letter as presented in a revised version in the agenda for Synod, Synod Supplement 2022 to underscore that the CRCNA Canada Corporation has ecclesiastical obligations and accountability alongside its legal requirements as a registered charity in Canada. Comments and questions? Was there a question that I... I think just part of conversation. I'm not seeing anybody asking any questions, so why don't you continue? Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Then F refers to the joint ministry agreements that were just referred to. You can see them in the chart, and the definition of that is found on page, uh, or the, the paragraph following in the document immediately after the chart. And so F refers to them and asks that Synod take note of the adopted process for developing and approving joint ministry agreements. These, again, are things, uh, agreements that hold the two legal entities together. Are there questions and comments? Any questions there? I'm not seeing any. Continue. Okay, then, uh, G, that Synod instruct the Office of General Secretary to review and clarify the use of terms agency, board, office, ministry, and similar names for CRCNA entities in order to provide clarity in communicating about the roles of these entities. So we noted in our committee that these terms were not always used consistently, and so we are asking that uh, that, that be reviewed and clarified. I see that there is a question from Hyung Jun Kim, and so please share your question. Uh, my name is Jun Kim. Um, I'm one of the ethnic advisors, but also from Canada. Uh, just a question or comment about, again, going back to the name. And uh, I think I heard the reason we have two different names for uh, Canada Corporation and U.S. Corporation is because of the confusion of Colleen's uh, existing executive director role. And in the future, because the two roles have somewhat different um, uh, responsibilities, therefore you are suggesting two different names. I'm personally um, thinking that having two different names will cause greater confusion, especially when the, being the two counterpart um, offices is important when we have two different names uh, as we currently see down the road will cause more confusion in my opinion and thus um, I'm personally wondering if having two executive directors Canada and US will make it more clear for uh, people to see the parity and the counterpart um, nature of the two offices. Thank you. Is that more of a comment than a, than a question? Or? Well, I, I think that it would be helpful to speak to, you've talked a little bit about the two different name things, but, but just maybe talk about why, why maybe our hands are tied to not make that name change right now, uh, if they're the same role. Okay, I see Michael going to the mic. He'll uh, speak to that. Yeah, if I if I could, the the titles of these of these positions um, were were chosen, I think, carefully and and deliberately to suggest that um, they aren't exactly the same roles. Um, they are different types of job descriptions and positions and responsibilities that each country is giving giving to its 
own um, a leader or director. And so the, the, those names were chosen intentionally. Um, those titles were chosen intentionally with the idea that there is, there, there is a responsibility that each of those two roles bears, but the responsibilities are different because of the different contexts in each of the countries. All right, I see no other questions. Okay, uh, then Mr. President, uh, we've worked our way through the entirety of recommendation two, so I believe at this time I would like to move recommendation two so that we can uh, officially adopt that. Do I uh, hear support? So any deliberation? I see that Anthony Ellenboss. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. I thought, uh, while we were still at the Synod, I should speak for something. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. So I, I am in favor of this recommendation. I, I would like to thank um, all those that um, did a lot of good work, I think, to resolve a number of the issues that were raised in terms of um, Canadian compliance with CRA laws. Um, so I, I very much appreciate uh, this, this recommendation, this structure. I think it will serve well. Um, I do take note of uh, three different things that I think will be challenges, and I think it's worth the COD and the incoming general secretary to note these things, uh, though I don't think they're significant enough uh, for us to vote this down. Uh, so that would be, uh, this places another corporation in between Synod and its denominational agencies. And I think um, in some sense that, um, yeah, we, we are creating, especially with the joint ministry agreements, um, a bit of a black box, uh, that it's, it's more challenging for this body to comprehend the functioning of its, uh, of its organization and its corporations. And so I just think that will be something that will have to be tended and stewarded well. And I know the COD and others are probably aware of that. The other thing is the, uh, the worldwide character of, uh, of this new corporation. When we have an eye to possibly including other national bodies outside of the US and Canada, I think we have to be uh, very careful uh, not for that to become a colonial or parental uh, relationship. And uh, I know that our incoming general secretary from Resonate uh, probably has a good skill set to take care of that. But I would just note those things, but I do vote in favor of this. I think it's an excellent structure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other debate? Sorry, deliberation. Seeing none, are we ready to vote? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Then we move to recommendation three. And I'm very grateful that we found time to get this on the floor of Synod before this evening. That Synod, upon a successful interview, appoint Dr. Zachary J. King as General Secretary of the CRCNA, effective July 1st, 2022. Reverend Paul Vanderclay will conduct a 30-minute interview with 15 minutes allowed for questions from the floor. I so move. I've heard that moved and seconded. Any discussion? We ready to vote? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Recommendation four, that Synod grant the COD authority to act on the appointment of a chief administrative officer should a nominee be identified and presented to the COD prior to Synod 2023. And there is a ground. The current process for filling executive staff positions requires ratification by Synod. I so move. I've heard this moved and seconded. Any discussion? Is this a one-time allowance for this position? Like if we're going to refill the, refill, reappoint a general administrative officer, will this always be done by the COD or is this just a one-time thing? I believe that it's a one-time situation. That's why it is specified prior to Synod 2023, yeah.
All right, I'm seeing no other speakers in the queue. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Recommendation five, that Synod, upon adoption of the new structure as proposed in the Structure and Leadership Task Force report and adoption of a new ecclesiastical corporation, grant the COD authority to appoint all senior level staff within the Office of General Secretary, including the Chief Administrative Officer, but excluding the General Secretary going forward. In the ground, this will facilitate smooth and timely transitions in filling leadership vacancies. I so move. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion about this matter? Seeing none, are we ready to vote? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Recommendation six, that Synod take note that the COD will review the status of Resonate Global Mission with a view to possible modification by a future synod in order to make its status equivalent to that of World Renew and Reframe Ministries, and that the purpose of such a review is to ensure internal ministry presence on the ministry's leadership council and to foster ministry integration. And so just so we're clear on that, when you hear the word review, you think that something is amiss or there has to be some correction uh, made. Uh, This review is something that is uh, strictly to help confirm whether the current board structure allows sufficiently for good governance of that agency uh, within the newly created legal and ecclesial structures. And so I uh, so move, Mr. President. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I'm seeing none. We ready to vote? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Recommendation seven, that Synod implement a conflict of interest policy for delegates to Synod, adapted from the policy in Appendix E to the SALT report, which was adopted by the Council of Delegates. I so move. It's been moved and seconded. I'm having trouble with that word. It's on the floor. Um, Any discussion? I'm seeing no one in the queue. Be ready to vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, then one final recommendation, that this be Synod's response to overtures 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and communication 2. Again, I just want to affirm that we took those overtures and communications seriously. We considered them and affirmed them. And uh, in the end, we feel that this proposed structure uh, addresses the concerns expressed in those overtures and communication, especially since they were primarily... Uh, looking at previous iterations of, uh, of the SALT report and subsequent developments have considered uh, their concerns. I so move. It's on the floor. I see that John Lee is in the queue. John Lee, I code, I want to speak against it. I'm sorry, I don't want to speak against it. Uh, I just want to note to the body as we wrap this up, um, I was part of the SALT task force and it was probably one of the more difficult things I've done in my life. Um, one of the things I've said, I've heard here, uh, I said there are no messianic structures that save us. Um, structures don't die for our sins, they die from our sins. And uh, we've had a lot of death in our history, and I, I just, I don't know if we're talked out, but this has gone really quickly, um, and I just want to acknowledge there is pain that we've never dealt with. And I don't want us to walk from here thing, now we've got a structure so we don't have to deal with it. I want to invite us as a church, as churches, as nations, to find each other in this and to do the work that we need to do and not trust that this will do the work for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate and speaking on behalf of our advisory committee, very much appreciate your words. I'm seeing no other names on the queue. Are we ready to vote? There's another name on the queue now. Daryl, welcome.
Sorry, I don't mean to be a stick in the mud. I'm um, Daryl DeClerc, class of BC Southeast. I, uh, I'm just wondering if there's precedent for allowing uh, a future synod to review uh, the progress of this new SALT structure, uh, say in three years or something like this. Uh, that way we put something down the line officially to be able to do that. And Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure how that would go, how we would go about this, but uh, maybe in a, a friendly amendment to this, this last one. I'll start, and I see Andy at the mic so he can follow up on my comments. We did talk about that a little bit. I think if you look at one of the initial uh, documents dealing with SALT, there was talk about uh, three year, a review after three years. Um, one of the conversations that happened in there, or one of the pieces that kind of helps that, is that the joint ministry agreements are reviewed every single year. And so there's sort of an ongoing regular conversation across both of the, at least the legal corporations uh, to allow that. Uh, but that conversation then, again, this is all assuming that good communication happens, which you can't put, you can't fit that into documents, right? Um, but assuming the system is doing what it is, the Office of General Secretary is, the, the, is the, the right place for managing those conversations and making tweaks as we go along. Uh, but we didn't think that this was a system that needed a, you know, a, a motion from us or a recommendation from us that compelled somebody to review it formally in you know whatever the time frame is, you want to say anything more, Andy? No, that, that, no, that's correct. No. Well, uh, then, Mr. Chairman, I just want to close by uh, echoing the expression of thanks from the Canadian churches. Although I don't speak for all of them, but at least from our corner in BC, thank you for the tremendous amount of work that was poured into this. I'm seeing no one else on the speaker queue. Are we ready to vote? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, may I address the floor? Yes, please do. I had a bit of a deja vu moment a little while ago. The Synod met three years ago. It was about seven weeks after the COD meeting where we identified many of the problems that we saw. And in between that meeting and Synod, we had spoken to lawyers, we had gotten a lot of opinions, and we realized that we had to make some major changes. On the Wednesday of that Synod, when we also went over for the banquet, I cornered Paul DeVries, who chaired at that time, and I was vice chairing, and we sat in a corner in the lobby of the the center over there for a couple of hours, realizing what a difficult position we were in. The amount of work and hours that have gone into this over the last three years has been a tremendous amount. The amount of sleepless nights I can't even, can't even begin to count. It's with deep appreciation um, as I sat here and see how these things get approved one by one. And that, to me, speaks volumes to the amount of good work that was done by so many people. So many people inside the COD and outside the COD that put this all together, that allows Canada to be uh, in compliance with its tax laws, but allows us to remain in a strong fellowship and a strong binational denomination. And I think that speaks volumes to what our vision is, what our mission is, and who we are as a denomination. So I just want to say how much I appreciate all of you for taking the time to deal with this, how much thanks I have for those that worked behind me through all this. And I think this is, as I said in my speech the other day, it's, it's a day now that we can dream of the beautiful things that are yet to come for our CRCNA. Well, thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of this report. Thank you very much, 1B. This also means that I get to turn the chair back over to Jose. When I was elected as vice president, I thought, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to chair anything at this upcoming synod. And that did not turn out to be the case. But this is the last time that I'll be taking the chair, unless somebody challenges Jose in the future. Uh, it's it's good that Jose is such a desired uh, task force or synodical study team member. So being both on this SALT 
report and the human sexuality report has given me multiple times to be here and I thank you for the opportunity uh, and I'm going to turn things back over to Jose. I'm, I'm being told that Luann has one more thing. John Lee, if you would come up here, I believe it is a gift certificate even. I think it's a Calvin Books. Okay, we will go back to 5B, and I really want to thank Derek for all that he did. It's not an easy task up here, and uh, he just really did well. I thank you very much, brother. So again, we're going to go back to um, Report 5B, the majority report. And uh, we had... We had agreed just before we, uh, we had to um, take a pause that we were going to ask Amanda Beckenheisen to come and speak. So we are going to give her the floor. Mr. Chairman, would you perhaps remind us what this motion is that we had been deliberating, just to give us clarity about all of this? Um, would you like to read, read the motion, Robert? Yes, Mr. Chair, I can do that. The recommendation in 5B is that Synod direct the General Secretary to forward the proposed Code of Conduct as amended by Committee 5 and the Implementation Plan recommended to Synod 2022 to classes for study and input and that they be revised in light of feedback received for consideration by Synod of 2023. And I'll leave the grounds off. Yes. Now. Just uh, go ahead, Amanda. Thank you. I appreciate the person who asked for the reminder of what was uh, what we're looking at because I don't know if I was remembering what we were looking at. That was a long time ago. So I think I was asked to come up here and just share a little bit about how the code of conduct came to be. And so let me just give you a little bit of history of the development. So in 2019, there was an Addressing Abuse of Power Committee that presented to Synod. And that committee was formed in response to a, a variety of overtures brought by Bev Sterk to the floor of Synod in 2018. And out of that came the formation of this Addressing Abuse of Power Committee and that committee reported to Synod in 2019 and made a series of recommendations that my office is actually still working on implementing. Uh, two of the main recommendations, and these were not um, the only recommendations, but two of the main recommendations were to put together uh, an abuse of power training course uh, that all candidates for ministry would take. And we have put that together. It's an online course. Um, it takes about four to six hours to go through. Um, we have renamed it The Power to Do Good, uh, wanting to really emphasize the positive aspect of power and how we use power for the flourishing of others. And um, we are now inviting office bearers, uh, ministers, elders, and deacons across the denomination to actually go through the training um, themselves, so not just candidates. Uh, the other main recommendation, uh, or another one of the main recommendations of the committee was to develop a code of conduct. Now there are a lot of um, professional organizations or um, professions that require signing a code of conduct, right? Teachers, doctors, lawyers, um, uh, uh, 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so the thought was, well, we should actually do that as ministers as well. We should um, covenant together, or ministry leaders, covenant together around a code of conduct. And in some ways, uh, this idea came out of the experiences of the committee as they were sort of grappling with how do we address abuse of power in the Christian Reformed Church? And as they were developing their recommendations over the course of that year, they heard stories, um, and that stories that I continue to hear in my office uh, today, in the year and a half that I've been there, um, stories about, for instance, confidentiality being violated um, at assemblies actually like this one. Um, whether it's at classes or at, at a synod or in other um, situations at other events where confidential issues were taken up with um, uh, you know, people involved in those issues and those were then talked about in public settings like the lunch line. Um, I've heard stories about, for instance, uh, women uh, being delegates at Synod and being hit on by other delegates uh, during the, the week that you're here. Um, we've heard of, they heard stories of people of color not feeling particularly welcome in this space. And I, I would just encourage you to look around you. Um, it's a pretty homogenous group here, right? And so, um, it can be kind of intimidating when you don't look like other people in the room uh, to be in a space like this. And so it's really helpful to know that the people who come together are committed to a certain standard of behavior and a certain mode of conduct. And so the thought was if we could covenant together, um, and, and I want to emphasize the covenanting together because it's not a top-down thing. Right? It's a, we agree as ministry leaders who have been given a sacred trust to use that sacred trust well. That we're going to use it for the flourishing of others. And we're going to do everything in our power to check ourselves so that we, when we say things, when we do things, we do them in ways that bring glory to God and uh, exemplify uh, the way of Jesus Christ, Christ-likeness. And so in 2019, a task force was formed. The task force was made up of people who had expertise in a variety of different areas. So there were people on the task force from Calvin Seminary. There was uh, someone on the task force from Calvin College who had expertise in social work. There was someone on the task force uh, with HR experience. Actually, it was Michelle Dubai, our own HR person, uh, director at the time. Um, there were people on the task force from Pastor Church Resources, and there was, was someone from Safe Church. So there was a variety of expertise around the table. And I don't know the exact process by which they came to the code of conduct that they came to, but um, I suspect part of it was looking at other codes of conduct and what kinds of elements are included in those codes of conduct. I suspect part of it was based on experience. What are the things that we're seeing in our denomination that we just want to make explicit uh, in a code of conduct that we don't want to behave in that way, that we want to hold ourselves to a higher standard? And so uh, the code of conduct uh, was formed by this task force, and it was brought to the COD early in 2020, okay? So that's like two and a half years ago. And I recognize it's been kind of an unfortunate journey because Synod was canceled in 2020. And then in 2021, the COD met in lieu of Synod, right? And so, um, in 2021, the COD, COD, on behalf of Synod, um, adopted the proposed code of conduct and instructed the COD to devise a plan for implementation for the denomination, classes, and churches 
per the instruction of Synod 2019. And so um, this code of conduct, it's on the CRC website. Um, it's been translated into Spanish and Korean. Uh, we have embedded it in the, the Power to Do Good course. Uh, we have been circulating it, circulating it among uh, ministry leaders cl through classes and uh, through other means. Um, so it's been out there for a while is what I wanna say. And so what we have before us is uh, the code of conduct, and that, you'll notice, was read uh, the, in its entirety on the floor of Synod. Uh, I think that was Tuesday. I'm losing. <laughs> um, I'm losing my track of time, but it was read on the floor of Synod in its entirety. It's not a long document, but I, I guess I just want to make an appeal to all of you. I think it is a document that um, invites us into greater Christ-likeness in our behaviors as ministry leaders in the Christian Reformed Church. And I know there were some questions on the floor, well, it's just another document. Um, how is this gonna be effective? But I think the goal of this was that uh, this begins to change the culture of the CRC so that we set higher expectations for ourselves Right? This is a covenant, this is not a top-down thing. It's a way to educate ourselves and remind ourselves again what we are called to do and be as ministry leaders. So, um, yeah, just I, I want to keep that in mind, uh, that the idea is more educational uh, than punitive. The idea is to give us a standard. Um, you might want to call it the cliff notes of the Bible in terms of standards of behavior. Um, but for me, it does a couple of things. One is it gives us something to look at to say, how am I using my power, right? Like I read through the code of conduct and I, every once in a while, like every, every couple of weeks, and I think to myself, how have I been stewarding my power? Have I been using it in ways to contribute to the flourishing of others or not? Have I been um, kind and, ge and generous in my relationships? Have I sought to protect uh, the well-being of others? Have I honored confidentiality? Have I dealt appropriately in my finances, and et cetera, et cetera, right? So it functions in that way as a way for me to kind of check myself. It can function um, at sort of a broader level, like I imagine councils could read this together annually. It takes five minutes and kind of engage in a conversation. How have we been doing as a council in um, modeling or in following in the footsteps of Jesus and being Christ-like in the ways in which we use power. The other thing it does is in a culture where you can't go a week without looking at the news and discovering more allegations of abuse being brought against church leaders. Um, I, could, I could give you a list of names, but um, the list seems to go on and on and on. In fact, as we speak, the Southern Baptist Convention is meeting to make some decisions about how they're going to uh, address abuse of power in their own denomination. And they've made all kinds of really interesting resolutions around that. We also want to be that kind of denomination that responds well. We want people to hear that we are committed and have committed ourselves to a standard of behavior, right? That, that, and, and are committed to creating a culture that resists abuse. So I guess I just put that all out to you. I want you to know there's been a lot of eyes on this code of conduct. There's been a lot of um, people who are in the know who have participated in putting this together. It's a thoughtful document, and I just commend it to you, um, and um, yeah, just ask that you would consider how we might uh, raise the bar in terms of how we covenant around behavior toward each other. Thank you.
We had a... Um, Could I ask a question of Amanda before she leaves? Real quick? That'd be acceptable. I just would love for her to tell us if we were to pass the, the motion that's on the floor that says that we would put this off for a year, how will that impact the ministries of the CRC? Yeah, you know, like I think, so I, again, I guess I would ask you to read through the code of conduct. Um, we've had a lot of things come before this synod where I think many of us have said it's not perfect, but we're going to be held together in this. Okay, the code of conduct may be not be perfect. I'm sure each of you wants to wordsmith pieces of it. But I, I guess I want to ask you, is it enough? Does it do what we want it to do in terms of calling us to a higher standard of behavior? Does it communicate to those who are vulnerable in our midst that we commit to being safer communities? And I think it does. So I... I'm not really excited about this, I'll be honest. I think in a day and age where we want to do everything we can to say to the broader community, we are committed to uh, using our power in ways that are responsible and um, appropriate to the trust that you have given us. I think this feels a little um, like we're delaying accountability. And I don't think that's the message we want to send. So. Thank you, Amanda. Um, we had a list of people in the queue, and unfortunately, because of the glitches, our little gremlin, or whatever you want to call it, we lost that list. So if you would like to speak to the motion, um, get on the queue. And again, let's be brief. Let's be concise and uh, speak to the motion. Would you like to read the motion once again so everybody knows? I'd like to make a preliminary comment before I reread the motion, if that would be okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I want to say that our committee affirms just about everything. Or let, me, let me say it even more carefully. The majority report and the people behind it affirm 98.9 percent of what Amanda just said and I want to make that very clear we are in favor of doing everything we can as a denomination and as churches to prevent cases of abuse and to find ways to deal with it when it has happened we are not trying to suggest to you or to your churches that this is something that is really not that big of a deal and you can just sort of do as you see fit and don't worry too much because abuse isn't in the church. That does not reflect the spirit of our group at all. We, we were united as a whole committee uh, behind the importance of uh, taking necessary steps. And we were even united in saying a code of conduct is a, is a good idea. Uh, we, were, we were simply differing on the best means to get a really, uh, to, to get a document that all churches could stand behind and buy into. And that's where our difference comes in. Um, if you have, and, and this, I'll read the motion in just a moment, but if you have the document open, uh, rep, uh, Majority Report 5B, if you have that open, it's a little bit misleading because it only has the paragraph that says spiritual. And if you happen to look at the minority report, that has the whole thing. And that is going to give you the misleading uh, understanding that the minority report is in favor of the whole document and the majority report is just in favor of item, uh, the item with the heading of spiritual. That is not the case. And I, I, you've heard me say that before and I'm saying it again. I may even say it one more time if need be because it is that important. I don't want that to be the impression. With that said, the recommendation from the majority committee is that Synod direct the general secretary to forward the proposed co code of conduct as amended by committee five with the underlying portion added and implement and the implementation plan recommended to Synod of 2022 to classes for study and input and that they be revised in light of feedback received for consideration by Synod of 2023. Thank you. I have Rick Admiral. Joe, Joel Vanderwerken, Anthony Ellenbus, and Benjamin Gandhi. Uh, Mr. Chair, Rick Admiral, Central Classes Plains, or I said that backwards, Classes Central Plains. 
Um, I'm a little nervous because I'm trying to remember what I was going to say the other day. It's been a little bit of time and um, challenges along the way, but I think what I was trying to say, if I remember it correctly, is urgency is absolutely critical in protecting the most vulnerable in our communities. So I speak against this particular motion, although I'm not against the work of the committee at all. I just don't think we can afford to wait another year. And so in that sense, I would love to defeat this and go to the minority report because of the fact that it moves a little quicker. Perhaps it would not be necessary, but we've already had a two-year delay uh, due to the pandemic, and I don't believe we should wait any longer in order to address this matter, in order to prevent any abuse of power whatsoever. Thank you very much. I, no, Tuesday was a long time ago, but I believe we defeated a the motion. We tabled and the motion was defeated. Yes, and so I don't believe we can go to the minority report, if I'm understanding that, my, right. Mr. That's Robert's right. rules correctly. Not my Robert, but you know. Okay. Point of order. Point, point okay. of order. We just tabled it. No. Point of order. Um, I asked Kathy about this a while ago. If this motion is defeated, the minority report can come back up for a vote. That's correct. But up to this point, we haven't had the vote yet. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Can I briefly respond to that? Yeah. So I, think, I think there's a little bit of confusion. There, there seems to be this sense that if we don't pass this, that we can't do anything about abuse until we do. And of course, that's blatantly untrue. If there's any abuse of any kind, we should deal with it yesterday. If not yesterday, then today. And, and nothing prevents us from doing that. And this document is available to the entire church in the meantime. And so in no sense does this decision impact whether we're going to deal with abuse of any kind or try to prevent it or call ourselves to the highest possible standards of godly behavior. And so that is not what I think anybody here is arguing for. Joel Vanderwerken, Anthony Ellenbus, Benjamin Gandhi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Joel Vanderwerken, Classes Atlantic Northeast. Um, I would speak in favor of this recommendation, and uh, I want to make clear that, like others have said, it's not the code of conduct itself that um, causes me to want to have a delay, but rather the implementation of that. And I think it's worth synods noting that when this came up in 2019, this came up in the, the supplement to the agenda. Synod did take it up and pass it. But here again, now we have the implementation that has come up in the COD report, which came out in March, or if you got the print materials, it didn't come out until April or May. And that's not anyone's fault, but it does mean that this item has not been before the churches for a lot of consideration. Your clock's not running either. I don't know if that matters, but um, I will try to be brief. Um, you know, and so the implementation pro promotes this as, uh, by placing it a, not as a supplement to, in, in Article 5, which is where the, council, the covenant for office bearers lies. And I, I think it's worth Synod's noting that that is a theological assumption about where it's placed in the supplement. It, we weren't told that it had to go any particular place in the supplement. And I think it's worth taking the extra time for the churches to say, is that really the best place for it? Is that how it functions? I think placing it kind of on the same spot as the covenant for office bearers confuses us a little bit about what the covenant for office bearers is and what it is that really holds us together with, as a denomination. Is it our things that we believe, or our confessions, and how they form and shape us, which would speak to a code of conduct, I understand, um, or is it our behavioral, our behavioral commitments, that we're nice people who care about vulnerable people in our midst? And I don't want to set those two things up against each other, but I do note that that they're not the same, and I think it's worth taking the time to consider where does this really fit in our structure, and how can we best then receive it? We could, could we adopt it this year? Absolutely. Uh, but I would say that that's in the, the um, category, like our COD uh, president said the other day, it's not a can we, but a should we. And I don't think we should, and I think this gives time for buy-in from the churches. So thank you. Anthony Elibus. Anthony Elibus, Classes Hamilton. Um, I speak against the motion, and uh, the reason is, as I recall from our conversation, uh, Kathy Smith noted, and I, I agree, and exactly as Joel said, this has not been uh, before us long enough. It is a substantive change to the church order, and therefore, uh, this majority report is not required. 
if we vote this down and move to the minority report um, and pass that recommendation, that this be added to, to uh, Church Order Article 5, that will require us to propose it from this synod to Synod 2023, which gives the churches a full year to deliberate over it, to write um, overtures and communications to Synod over it, and uh, to allow us to have that robust discussion. And Synod 2023 can therefore choose to adopt it at that time if it has satisfied itself to the concerns of the churches in relationship to this document. Um, but if Synod 2023 realizes that this is, we would like this somewhere else in the church order, or we need to do something different with it, Synod 2023 could always bump it down the road further to allow for more conversation. I think uh, the minority report allows us to have the, the quickest window to adopting this should the churches decide it is a good idea. Uh, whereas I think the majority report recommendation before us currently uh, could possibly delay that implementation longer. And so uh, again, I vote against this, recognizing that the main concern that I've heard the last time we talked about it, and this time too, is that we need time. And I believe the minority report much more cleanly gives us the prescribed church order route of time and deliberation uh, that we are indeed asking for. And if uh, that needs to be clarified, then I'd certainly invite Kathy Smith to speak to it further. May I, I, I don't know who that was stopping, maybe. Um, um, may, I, may I respond just briefly yes. to, so I think, I think our concern would be that if we adopt the minority report and we say, well, the change to the church order effects a one-year review and ratification by Synod of 2023, I think the focus then goes on what are the implications of changing church order, whereas what we are asking for is what does this document say? Does it say enough? Are there certain aspects of it that may be unclear? So we're trying to keep the focus on uh, on the document as and more and and less on the, if you want to call them the legal implications to the church order. Okay, I use legal in the sense there in, in terms of how it applies to uh, to church order law. And I realize I've got about seven lawyers in the room, so I need to be careful with that term, maybe. But okay, Benjamin. Uh, ben Gandy, Classes Grand Rapids North. I speak in favor of the motion, Mr. Chairman. I will say that putting, off the, putting this off for a year does not mean that churches in which we serve cannot adopt this whole code, code of conduct tomorrow. You can copy and paste this document and apply it to all ministry leaders, should you so choose, requiring them to sign on to this code of conduct, thereby requiring them to act biblically. Mr. or Ms. Mouse Clicker, I would ask that you scroll up or down though to, uh, I want to point something out that we cannot see on the screen as of right now. If you scroll down to the underlined thing, it's not obvious that the underlined sentence in Report 5B is an addition to the Code of Conduct. The craft of this sentence proved a difficult discussion for our committee, but the sentence is a worthwhile addition to the Code. I want to point out that admonishment and discipline will be differently interpreted based on the recommendations from reports 8B1 and 2 as, as well as 2B. Christ-like, as it says, biblical admonishment and discipline should not be construed as abuse. Should the grave process of discipline be required in a church, classes, or synod, I speak for time for churches to think through what that will look like and how it can be misconstrued as abuse, and therefore I speak in favor of this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Larry Lauders, Scott Vanderplug, Barbara Baldheis. Can I ask a point of order, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, we had agreed as a synod that we were going to debate things a certain amount of time, and our debate started before we tabled. I'm wondering how much time we have left on our debate and how the chair is going to operate us through that. How much time do we have to do Not much. Do you have any recollection of how long our first debate was? 44 minutes. 44 minutes. <laughs> 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 
two days ago to me feels like an eternity ago, so I have no recollection myself. It's worse when you realize it was only yesterday. <laughs> that might take us. Yes. <coughs> and the acknowledgement that we have much work to do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Perhaps the chair could make a motion to cease debate and test the will of the body. I make a motion to cease debate then. <laughs> Those in favor of ceasing say aye. Um, our parliamentarian was speaking up, oh, okay. just as you. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you could scroll down. I had my name in the queue, and I was trying to get it here before you um, cease debate. Um, I had said this the other day, that ground number two um, is inaccurate because the proposed code of conduct does not modify the covenant of office bears, and you said that was going to come out, but I still see it there. So I wanted to say that before yes. we are in no amendment territory. And thank you. And um, we, we we don't have the power to edit once it's been submitted, and so I would just defer to the people who have that power. We would consider it a friendly amendment. I think it was just more of a poor choice of language on our part for that. And so if there's a way just to clarify that it's, um, wow, that was good. That's right. All right, the motion is to cease debate. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Aye. We cease debate. What do you say, both the voice vote or or electronic vote? Voice. voice. Electronic. <laughs> electronic then. So. Um, could you give us three minutes? We have a little gremlin again. <laughs> we think you might also, if this is defeated, I think you're just because then you get to present. So, sure. Um, just be ready. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Voting should be available now. You just might need to re refresh your screen.
Yes, we're going to, as, as you're voting, Committee 1C, we're going to continue with that. So, so we can have the chair and the reporter for, for uh, Committee 1. The president has asked me to reiterate what he just said. Right after we uh, get the vote total, we're going to be moving to advisory committee 1C. And so the president requests that the, the chair and reporter of 1C come up so that we're prepared to take up that matter as soon as voting concludes. That would be Richard DeLang and Peter Hoytema. We'll be closing the vote in one minute. It's not working yet. It's not working. Did you, did you refresh it? Refresh your screen. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, yes. Could could I give a really useful piece of technical advice so that if we we're having problems in the future, it might go quicker? You mean buy a new computer? No, no, no. It's even easier than that. Oh, if you've got a Windows machine, you can press F5 and it will refresh the page. But if you hold down your Control key and you press F5 at the same time, it will really refresh your your page and reload all the scripts so it will work better, you'll probably have better success that way. It's just helpful. Thank you. Voting is closed. The motion passed. And now we're going to go to 1C. 122 to 52. And one abstain. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. President. We are looking at 1C from uh, Synodical Services and Structure. 
Our uh, report here basically uh, covers the review of materials from the Council of Delegates. I don't think I need to read the observations there. We've heard that already a number of times about uh, how we have been impacted by the uh, pandemic and the uh, cancellation of synods. I just want to mention that we did, as a committee, read these minutes carefully. That's not uh, simply a perfunctory rubber stamping of minutes that, uh, that took place there in committee. And so with that in mind, I would like, uh, I th Mr. President, can I combine recommendations one and two? They're essentially the same with uh, only the years being different. Yes. Okay. Then recommendations one and two, that Synod ratify the minutes of the special meeting of the Council of Delegates 2020 and 2021, acting in lieu of Synod's 2020 and Synod 2021. I so move. Any discussion? You kind of scared me. It said 21 people in the queue. <laughs> that was the last one. <laughs> Seeing there is no discussion, those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposite sign the same. Motion passes. Okay. Pray. Um, before we go to prayer, I thank you very much for. Okay. Before we go to prayer, um, in many ways, this has been. Um, difficult synod, but um, I want to um, share with you some things that are going on. We had one classes uh, member, one, one member from classes Alberta that did go to the hospital. He is at home, he's doing fine. Um, then there's three of us that have a parent that is either in the hospital or, or um, hospice care last few days. And um, if that were not enough, Miguel Randall from Central Plains um, came and shared with me that there was a death in the family. And he may need to leave early. So, as we do this prayer, let's keep this in mind that these things happen, they're always painful but the grace of our Lord is sufficient for all of us. Please join me in prayer. God Almighty, Father, Lord Jesus Christ, head of the church, an indwelling spirit, we come to you in prayer, thankful for your grace to us in this day. In the last number of days, we have dealt with many heavy things that have burdened us, that have divided us to some degree, but it is your power and your grace that can sustain us, that can heal us, that can unite us. And we pray, Lord, for uh, the humility, the grace, the strength, the courage, whatever it takes for us to learn to live together, to do so. And Lord, we thank you that you are with us, that you love us, that you'll never leave nor forsake your people. And so God, we pray for forgiveness of all of our sins in these times, in thought, in word, in deed. And we pray that you will move us forward with your power and your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. God Almighty, we come to you as our loving Father, we come to you as the great physician, and we pray for those who are ill. Thank you, Lord, for the grace you've given to those who have recovered somewhat already, and we pray that you will be with them in their recovery. We pray for those who may be dying, Lord, that you will watch over them and give them your dying grace too. Lord, you promise to be with us from beginning to end of life, from cradle to grave, from uh, first breath to last. Every day ordained for us is written in your book, and so we take comfort in knowing that you hold us. You hold us in your hands. You know the exact places where we will live. You know 
the hairs on our head, and so our life is in you and in your hands. And so we live our life because of you. It is your grace that says that we belong to you, body and soul, that we are in Christ. And so we give you praise and thanks for your promise and for your provision. Now bless our time of refreshment and uh, food together. Thank you for giving us so much and for each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We will reconvene at 7 p.m.